That's, um, thank you. So over to you, Lucia. Thank you. So let me know if you can see the slides. Yep. Screen okay. sharing. Yeah. So we decided to have a little um, talk about um, red eyes. So I'll try to um, uh, go through some slides and then you're very welcome. If you have questions, we can at the end have some discussion. Um, we just um, go for an overview of the most common uh, anterior segment condition without doing too much of a list or treatment list, which is a little bit um, overwhelming. And, uh, but, you know, we, we keep it open to discussion. I mean, the, the most common demanding topic, um, whenever I give talks to optician or GPs uh, in primary care, most cases of dry eyes, painful eyes and red eyes are around problems with the ocular surface. Um, so we go through some uh, principles of how to examine and how to go for differential diagnosis of these cases. Um, so obviously when you examine the eye and you listen to the patient, first of all, we talk to the patient and we listen to their concerns and their symptoms. And there is a huge overlap between symptoms um, that are very common in different conditions. And also when you examine the eye with a slit lamp with a microscopic examination from the adnexal and conjunctiva and cornea, there is a huge overlap of signs. Um, so we've got to discern in our mind what are the primary symptoms and what are the most important signs in order to come to a differential diagnosis of what is the main number one cause of the problem. And maybe sometimes there is a number two cause of the problems. Um, so in terms of symptoms, most of the anterior eye ocular surface problems relate um, uh, to pain, itchiness, burning sensation. Uh, light sensitivity is one of the most common symptoms described by patients and obviously excessive watering and lacrimation. And sometimes they present with discharge, mucus discharge, crystallized discharge on the eyelid margin. Um, some of the anterior segment conditions also have an effect on visual acuity and visual function because any compromise of the ocular surface from the simplest dry eye has an impact on the ocular function. Um, when we examine the patient at the slit lamp, or even before we use the slit lamp, just examining the patient um, external eye examination, you will pay attention to hyperemia of the eyelids, um, the appearance of the eyelashes and the lid margin, the position of the lid margin is very important. And then when you go to the lid lamp, you pay more attention to microscopic signs like cornea, the cornea epithelium, the conjunctiva. You will use your um, fluorescein drops to highlight any epithelial defects and the distribution of the tear film. And obviously, we always examine the um, averting the eyelids, the palpebral conjunctiva, and um, presence of papillary changes of follicles. Um, when we, um, the, the first and main problem presenting to primary care and also to the eye casualty and to the cornea clinics are problems related to lubrication. Uh, so there are many um, primary pathogenetic mechanisms giving rise to um, dry eyes. And there are many, we've got a plethora of topical drugs that we can choose from. And it's sometimes difficult to decide in our mind whether we are um, just going for a very simple lubricant or whether we add lubricant plus an anti-inflammatory or whether sometime you may go for a triple type of treatment. And one principle is to try to always keep it as simple as possible for the patient, because we all know that despite how many drops and explanations you give to the patient when they go home they will probably not follow every single instructions if you suggest to put six times a day, six times a day drops um, most of them will put three or four drops a day and then as soon as they start getting better they will put probably even less so the least number of medications we give the better um, pathogenetic mechanism obviously the most common is abnormal tear film um, and this is a combination of what we get from the lacrimal gland and what we get from the meibomian glands of the eyelids. There may be some um, inflammatory reaction. 
so cytokines and um, other inflammatory molecules released on the ocular surface may have a, a huge part in chronicity of symptoms and poor response to topical treatment. Um, obviously, we need to screen for also infections because some patients with dry eyes or severe dry eyes may present with infective complications. And we also need to think about the innovation of the ocular surface, the innovation of the cornea, um, and whether there is a problem in the um, uh, stimuli going to the lacrimal gland because there is a neurotrophic component and therefore um, the response of the ocular surface is abnormal simply because there is no loop going to the lacrimal gland. Um, we also need to remember that when we examine the conjunctiva and the cornea, we want to pay attention to the epithelium and very subtle changes that could go on to develop you know, plastic changes may start with very subtle signs on the conjunctiva. We must not forget to examine the limbo part of the eye and the conjunctiva, any abnormalities, vascularization of the cornea, and think about whether there is any possible change. Uh, in terms of drugs, we have, again, um, a very large choice from tear substitutes to anti-inflammatory of different sorts, non-steroidal, steroidal, and um, immunomodulators like cyclosporine, um, antibiotics. All of this, of course, come in preserved preparation and preservative pre-preparation. So depending on the severity of the patient you're facing, um, we have to make that choice as well. And, and then obviously we've got the group of anti-metabolites, which are less commonly used, and the anti-VEGF. Anti-VEGF are very commonly used for retina, neovascularization due to macular degeneration, but they're also used for anterior segment when we have uh, abnormal vascularization of the cornea, and particularly after cornea transplants, when we have new vessels and recurrent hepatic problems with new vascularization and rejections. Um, it's always good to uh, think about a step ladder approach in any condition we uh, manage. And we should always, as a principle, start from the simplest and uh, cheapest approach and then escalate to combinations of drops or more expensive medication or tertiary um, prescriptions only. Um, depending on the response and the, the signs that we observe. So if we talk about dry eyes, um, you all know um, that the, the, the description of the tear film and the layers uh, being represented by a very thin layer of oily um, film produced by the mevionine glands, and then the aqueous layer and the mucin layer produced by the goblet cells of the conjunctiva. Uh, one thing that I would like to mention is that one of the most recent types of lubricants um, um, are lubricants that are replacing the oily um, layer of the tear film. So until now, most of the lubricants we prescribe are replacing the watery component that is produced by the lacrimal gland. Uh, but we know that one of the most common type of dry eyes is what we call evaporative dry eyes. And evaporative dry eyes is due to um, uh, insufficient lipid layer. And that means that the mevoven glands are not functioning or partially functioning. Some of them are blocked. Um, and when we are dealing with patients with chronic mevoven gland disease, the mevoven glands are just um, uh, non-functioning. They've not been functioning for a long time. And just applying warm compresses will not rehabilitate the function of the oily glands. And at that point, we need to give the patient some sort of substitutes of the oily layer. Otherwise, their symptoms will not improve despite how many drops, how frequently um, you put them and how many gels you give to them. So some of these um, lipid replacement drops, uh, I don't know if you are aware of some names, um, um, Scope Optamics is producing some. There is uh, a drop called Evo Tears. There is another drop from Evolve. Um, they're not very commonly found in the chemist. We get lots of free samples and we are just starting to educate patients that the use of this lipid replacement actually helps symptoms. They don't need to be 
um, applied as often as the um, aqueous replacement drops. So this type of drops can go in maybe twice a day or three times a day, and then the rest of the day, the patient can still use um, standard lubricants. We'll touch about the, we'll touch upon the uh, benefit of nutrition a little bit lay, later. So you know that, so this is what we were talking about was uh, evaporative dry eyes, where you've got a, an insufficient lipid layer. Uh, the other type that we generally treat with replacement of the watery layer is the aqueous deficiency dry eyes. So these are all the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, Sjogren disease, um, there are, of course, patients with dry eyes. They present with dry eyes secondary to an inflammatory condition. And for this group of patients, obviously, we need to treat the inflammation as a primary um, pathological problem. And the tear instability, may bomb and gland disease, is part of the evaporative dry eyes, basically. But they are in a kind of an earlier stage, um, uh, less severe stage of the disease. <clears throat> So the tear instability can still be addressed by lead hygiene and nutritional intervention. Um, lots of causes, obviously, you know, of most of this, and we know that um, um, there may be an occupational uh, factors um, causing dry eyes. Poor blinking is a, obviously a very important factor. Uh, lifestyle um, and environmental conditions. Um, glaucoma medication um, obviously are on the top of the list. And we know that when we are dealing with patients on multiple other medications for other conditions, the dry eye is always a secondary type of dry eyes. Um, up to half of the patients using one or two anti-glaucomatous agents will present with ocular surface problems. Um, and some of them will go on and develop uh, persistent epithelial defects and a more kind of severe presentation of the problem. Uh, contact lens use, of course, is, is another very common factor, is a high risk factor for the combination of dry eye and contact lenses is very dangerous and exposes the patients to risk of uh, complications like infections, ulceration, microbial keratitis, and so on. And eye surgery, we must not forget that every time we do any routine operation, even the most routine cataract, uneventful cataract surgery, and we treat patients for four to five weeks with topical preserved antibiotic and steroid, we change the ocular uh, balance of lubrication, we change the ocular flora, we change the function of the meibomian glands, and a very large proportion of elderly patients being on drops for four or five weeks, when they attend for the post-operative follow-up, three, four weeks after cataract surgery, will have ocular surface changes. And more of their complaints, most of their complaints will be relating to the comfort of the eye. Even if the vision is great, brilliant and bright and the colors are beautiful, they will say that the eye is still feeling a bit gritty and a bit burning. And these are all secondary effect of the medications we give them. So principles for topical treatment. First of all, when we examine, we need to try to understand what is the main factor causing each uh, specific case of dry eyes. Obviously, uh, the first aim of the treatment is to relieve symptoms and to achieve comfort. And sometimes this is the most, the, the biggest challenge we have, because even when we treat dry eyes and we review the patient and we feel that from the objective examination, the ocular surface looks beautiful and you don't see any staining, it's very frustrating facing patients that, where they feel that they haven't had any improvement. They still have very severe symptoms. They're very miserable. They're still using maximum treatment. And you look at the ocular surface and you feel that looks pretty, pretty normal and the eye looks pretty quiet you still have an unhappy patient and you still need to find some other solutions to improve comfort. This is the biggest challenge we have. Uh, in terms of objective, sorry, we go back. Objective measurement, obviously we can, there are lots of tests that can be done to, to measure the tear production from the simplest shimmer test to measuring the osmolarity of the tear film with uh, paper strips, um, there are digital measurements of the osmolarity, um, but still, you know, the objective examination of this lit lamp is it's still the most important step. Uh, obviously, we want to treat the inflammation, 
because um, we all know that dry eyes enter um, a long and vicious cycle where the dryness is causing um, inflammatory signs and the inflammatory signs aggravate the dryness, the inflammatory uh, processes affect the, the function of the goblet cells, of the lacrimal gland, um, the function of the mevoban gland. Um, and so if we don't treat the inflammation, the dry eyes will not get better. And this is the principle behind using cyclosporine drops, um, which was basically started in the States and then gradually um, uh, spread in Europe. And when we finally got the license um, uh, cyclosporine, which is Icervis, we are now treating Icervis, we're treating patients with Icervis in, um, in hospital as a hospital prescription. So the principle is to treat the inflammation long-term with the minimum amount of treatment. Icervis is given once a day and is a steroid sparing agent. So you get rid of all the risks of side effects related to steroid use and prolonged steroid use, and you can safely administer cyclosporine on a long-term basis um, beside the other lubricants and tear substitutes. Um, the examination of the lid function, the movement of the eyelids, the blinking and the position is extremely important. And if you pay enough attention to the eyelid, the elasticity of the eyelids, the uh, tension of the canters, you will find that many, many dry eyes, many patients complaining of symptoms actually have lid, lid laxity, even if they don't have very obvious malposition of the eyelids. So many of this may benefit from an assessment from an oculoplastic specialist. Um, and if they have lid laxity, addressing the lid laxity has a huge impact on the improvement of symptoms. Again, with lid laxity, you may not see very much on the ocular surface. You get a reasonably good wetting, but because the blinking function is not um, so efficient, they still have symptoms of burning sensation. They have the epiphora. Um, and obviously most of these patients will be sleeping, if you ask them, they will tell you that they sleep on one side, they're very used to rub their eyes, and the lid laxity obviously is a secondary effect of all this over many years. So addressing the lid laxity with um, tightening of the lid and lateral cantal uh, tendon will have huge benefit on the comfort of the patient. This is about the step ladder approach. We always start from the simplest intervention, the simplest and cheapest treatment. And then if the patient doesn't respond, we can escalate. We can combine more than one um, medical intervention, more than one drop, and then we can escalate to adding puncture plugs. Um, and then we can escalate to anti-inflammatory medication. And then the tertiary kind of level of treatment, which is the eye curve is um, the simplest um, measures and education of the patient that obviously starts from you, from primary care, is educating patients to clean their eyelids properly. Uh, so lead hygiene um, and uh, cleaning of the eyelashes and uh, prevention of, of um, infective complications of the adnexa. Uh, tear supplementation is the second step. And then modification of the tear film with anti-inflammatory, or other drops such as um, acetylcysteine um, and, and other uh, medications. Sometimes we need to add antibiotics, either orally, if you are dealing with a dry eye combined with rosacea or blepharitis, and sometimes we combine the anti-inflammatory with topical antibiotics as well. In terms of which lubricant to choose, obviously we always start and if most of these patients would be started already on treatment by the GP and by yourself. So GPs normally go from for the simplest um, eye drops, preserved eye drops, such as Ipromelos or Carmelos or Celubisc. Uh, when patients arrive to us and they still have symptoms despite this primary line intervention, then we will probably, most of the cases, we step up with preservative-free sodium hyaluronate of different strengths. So you are aware that you know, sodium hyaluronate um, is available as a 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, um, and sometimes it's combined with other molecules in order to increase the stability of the tear film. 
And tear modification is obviously something we do in hospital because this will require prescription of medications such as anti-inflammatory, um, um, acetylcysteine that I mentioned before, or cyclosporin. The acetylcysteine has a space where you have the, um, an excessive production of protein, which is the mucin, the mucin layer of the tear film, and a deficit in the aqueous layer of the tear film. So we have a group of dry eye patients presenting with what we call filamentary keratitis or superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. They have a very inflamed conjunctiva, they have overproduction of proteins, and they have these mucous filaments and blobs and foreign bodies that they produce. And these foreign body um, particles are they get stuck, very adhesive to the cornea. So the patient will complain of foreign body sensation, grittiness, and not much lac lacrimation at all. They have very, very dry eyes. So in order to restore the balance in their tear film, we need to obviously restore the lubrication with um, uh, lubricants, watery lubricants, you've got to dissolve the proteins using the acetylcysteine, and then sometimes you've got to combine with some topical anti-inflammatory because these eyes are very inflamed. You, you look at the bulbar conjunctiva, they're very red, extremely uncomfortable. Another intervention that works in this type of dry eyes with overproduction of the protein is the use of bandage contact lenses. Obviously, we we are always extremely careful in introducing contact lenses in patients with dry eyes because you worry about the risk of infections. But this type of dry eyes will hugely benefit from the contact lens because the contact lens will stop the deposition of the protein, the mucus deposition on the cornea, and therefore the comfort, the sensation of foreign body basically decreases a lot. And um, fitting them on bandage contact lenses means that the patient will have a bandage lens replaced every seven weeks. And on average, need to stay on a contact lens for probably three to four months. And then you can try to give them a break and continue with topical treatment. Um, this is just something about the eye curvis. Obviously, it's a tertiary, is, you know, it's, it's a tertiary um, medication. I always um, tell the juniors we don't prescribe eye curve is the first time you see a patient with dry eyes presenting to the eye casualty. We should go in a, a kind of a, a step ladder approach and we always start from the simplest intervention. Most patients will do well. We reserve cyclosporine to patients not responding to topical lubrication. We need to keep in mind it is a very expensive medication. It is prescribed once a day for three months and the patient is reviewed three months later. Uh, GPs generally um, cannot prescribe cyclosporine. This is a hospital-only prescription. And if patient needs repeated prescriptions, I always repeat the prescriptions from the hospital pharmacy. It's a very safe medication. Um, up to a couple of years ago, there were lots of concerns. Every time I prescribed Icurbis cyclosporine, um, the GP would respond with a long letter uh, with concerns about anti, well, immunodepressive or immunosuppression effects of, of this medication. But when we use it topically, there are there is plenty of papers and literature showing that this is a very safe medication. So it's always good to add an extra line in the letter to the GP and also explain it to the patient to reassure that this will not have any side effect on them on, on the general health or even on the eye. Other things slightly less common, just interesting to know, the, uh, there have been studies um, uh, published about the use of finger prick uh, autolycus blood in the treatment of resistant persistent dry eyes despite maximum treatment. Um, uh, the group in Cambridge um, has been publishing a lot on uh, finger prick uh, autolycus blood. And another intervention is the use of serum uh, blood, um, so autologous serum drops. And these drops can be prepared in three or four um, laboratories in central London. The patient needs to go to the specific laboratory where the blood is taken. And then the laboratory will prepare about 50 or 60 small frozen bottles that will be posted to the patient and the patient will use the serum drops. Um, 
this particular intervention obviously is very expensive and it's a hospital um, treatment that we arrange with the lab and we reserve this for patients with extremely severe dry eyes, resistant to um, maximum treatment and very often presenting with persistent epithelial defects. So these are non-healing defects on an ocular surface which is extremely um, disrupted with severe dryness. And these are kind of the last, last resort before we intervene surgically with other types of interventions like amniotic membrane grafting to cover non-healing ulcers of the cornea in neurotrophic corneas and so on. I just want to touch on another condition that is very closely related to dryness, but has a different kind of etiology, which is a bacterial and an inflammatory cause. So we just talk a little bit about blepharitis and the uh, spectrum of presentation of blepharitis from the simplest, mildest presentation to the most severe. So it's a spectrum of basically conditions going from the most common meibomian gland disease, blepharitis, to the very severe rosacea. So when you listen to the patient, again, they will tell you that the eye is watery, they've got foreign body gritty sensation. The burning and stinging is a very, very common symptoms. And this is because they have an excess of uh, production of the oily film and they have burning sensation stinging because of changes in the pH of the tear film. They complained of blurred vision and they have very often, they tell you that the eyelids are quite itchy and, and uncomfortable. When you observe it, the, normally they have hyperemia, hyperemia of the lid margin, uh, hyperemia of the conjunctiva, and they may present with a classic calasium sty and classic signs of marginal keratitis. So it is a spectrum starting from the mildest blepharitis calasium and then escalating to corneal disease. It becomes corneal disease when you see someone with marginal keratitis and then more severe cornea disease when you see new vascularization of the cornea and then perforation. These patients will end up with severe collagen problems of the cornea, perforation. Some of them may need tectonic patch graft. So these are um, some of uh, pictures of a patient. This is a young patient, she's 18, and she has very severe bilateral rosacea. You can see that both eyes have neovascular changes on the cornea. She has a panus with conjunctivalization of the right corneal epithelium. She has a smaller lesion on the left eye. Uh, she's controlling this with permanent, well, ongoing doxycycline treatment ongoing topical dexamethasone, topical chloramphenicol, and bandage contact lenses. Uh, she has well-established blood vessels despite ongoing dexamethasone, and obviously she has corneal opacities secondary to the panel, so she has a very, very aggressive disease. And if I show you the next slide, again, on the right, you have pictures of an elderly woman started off presented for the first time on the top. The image on the top is how she presented to casualty. So she presented with very little symptoms. She presented with red eye and she said, oh, my, my vision has dropped. The eye is not very painful, it's been red for a long time, but now I cannot see. And when we looked, she had a perforated cornea ulcer. You can see the white island there with the brown pigment in the middle is a cornea perforation which is plugged by iris tissue. The iris has been dragged to the perforation and plugged the hole. So the anterior chamber was reasonably deep and um, she didn't have much leakage, but we covered with a bandage contact lens. We treated her topically first and then this thinning of the stroma was not getting much better. The uh, epithelium um, had a persistent defect. And so we went on to do a first tectonic graft. So if you see the image on the right in the middle, you can see a patch graft tectonic, which means that is a full thickness corner graft um, with nylon um, sutures. Despite that, she was on oral uh, doxycycline, topical dexamethasone, topical antibiotics. She represented a few months later with a second perforation next to the tectonic graft and we had to do a second tectonic. So the image down to the right, you can see that there are now two discs of full thickness cornea. And these patients not only have problems with ongoing infections and perforation, but they have a very 
um, difficult type of cornea to suture because the, the collagen is basically melting. Uh, suturing this eye is very challenging and very often the nylon stitches will uh, become very loose very easily uh, because there is a constant inflammatory reaction. So they need to be on maximum topical um, anti-inflammatory treatment. Going back to a little bit of education, in my case, it's very important to educate patients on how they can change nutrition because this has a huge impact on the lubrication of the eye. Um, but this is obviously for the mild um, first stage of dry eye disease. So it's good to explain to them that vitamin E, flaxseed oil, omega-3 fatty acids all help the function of the main bombing glands. And it's all good to explain, obviously, the greens are good for the macula, but they're also good for the front of the eye. And oily fish, cod liver oil, omega-3 in particular, is very good for the meibomian glands. So there are supplements. Um, there is one supplement called Omega Eye, which is a high concentration of omega-3. Um, there are many other, as you know, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, mixed combination of supplements. But particularly the omega-3 seems to be beneficial for the um, eyelids and for the mineral glands. Alternative treatments that patients with ongoing symptoms of dry eyes or blepharitis may have something called lipid flow. Lipid flow is a topical application of basically heat on the eyelids. It's the, the principle is the same as when we say apply hot compress with a, a face flannel and hot water, um, but obviously it's done in an office condition, clinic condition. Um, another way to apply heat is another instrument, Mabel Flow, which is basically using light, um, infrared light. And again, the principle is just to increase the temperature at the, at, at the site of the um, Mabel and glands and the eyelids. I think we're going to stop here for today because we've done about half an hour and I just wanted to give you... Um, you know, so to go through red eyes and the most common conditions I'm sure you're facing as, as much as we are. Um, if there is any question, I'm happy we can stop for a few minutes and go through some discussion and then we go ahead with the case review. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or pop it in the chat if you'd rather not speak. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Lucia, for that. Thank you for, for running through a lot of useful information. I'm just going to stop recording now, if that's okay.